Hello Mouthpiece Refacing fans. What I have here is a Barry Sachs Brillhart Special Ebelin Mouthpiece. It's made of plastic. It's essentially a, uh, a stock mouthpiece even though it's got a name brand on it. It only comes in one tip opening. I don't know the history of this whether they uh, came in uh, with saxes or not but it, it's a good uh, basic uh, mouthpiece for either a beginner or part-time player or, or somebody who doesn't like a lot of tip opening. Uh, the tip opening is on this one uh, 83 thousandths. For modern Barry players uh, that's kind of you know closed. So the person who owns this, um, a guy from the Netherlands, purchased it on eBay and had it sent directly for me because he he's had me work on a couple mouthpieces for him and he wants me to open this one up to uh, 115 or 130, uh, 120. That's a lot to go for a mouthpiece. Uh, it's about 40 thousandths of an inch. It can be done because the tip on this mouthpiece, the material that we have left there to work with for tip cutting, well, it depends on how deep you put your jaws on there, but if you try to get it close to the very tip, see it about 51, 50 thousandths. So if we're going 40, that's going to make this pretty sharp. it will be only 10 thousandths of the material left, but at least, at least the material is there. Um, and what we can do is after, uh, I'll show you as I open this up, we can trim it back a little bit and, and blunt, make that blunt um, on, on the tip. It'll give it a little more material. The uh, side walls inside this mouthpiece are straight. And if anything, they're kind of what I would call A-shaped. They, uh, they slope and get wider as they go in. So there is a little bit of a risk with a mouthpiece like that or with um, one that is has curved sidewalls that as you cut the tip open uh, the window keeps getting wider and wider. Um, in this case the rails are thick enough and inside uh, the width of a standard reed that I think will be okay. So that's something to look out for. Um, and as we open the tip, I'll show you how the geometry changes. How the um, as we open, it's going to get wider here. We'll have to trim back the um, uh, the width of the rails, and the uh, tip rail is going to get huge. Uh, the owner wants me to give him as much baffle as possible. Um, I usually don't like a rollover baffle, but um, I'll probably give him one on this one. Uh, what's in there now is almost perfectly straight. At the very end, it kind of just barely, barely kind of has a little bit of a roll there. Um, on the uh, the windows, a little has a little bit of a wall there. We'll under maybe undercut that later. Um, this is you know plastic cast. There's there's uh, probably injection molding. Uh, the core for this window is a little off center. Uh, that's not uncommon. Probably most of them are off center. So you can see the windows. Shifted this way a little bit. This rail is a little thicker than that one. Um, looking inside the mouthpiece, you can see that there's a seam inside the chamber here, and the two ends, the two cores, don't don't meet up very well. So um, I'll probably uh, there's some ridges in there that I'll uh, smooth out with the Dremel, and uh, that's not the focus of what I want to show you today. I'm just going over what my plan is. Um, speaking of the plan, I'll zoom into the uh, my spreadsheet here. This, as I've mentioned on other videos, is the uh, exaggerated plot of the facing curve in this orientation. This is the tip opening, tip rail thickness, and this is the table back here. Uh, some some have asked me, why do you do it that way? Well, uh, instead of orienting the graph this way or this way and uh, yeah this is a little more intuitive but you can get used to this and it's the way that Excel naturally wants to plot the graph as I enter the tables in the uh, fill out the table of readings in the order that I take the readings for the uh, facing curve 
Um, so I decided not to fight the program. I did try uh, some earlier versions where I flipped the axis and this and that, and it just ends up being a real can of worms. So uh, I recommend laying it out the simplest way possible and just getting used to it. So this uh, curve, it's got a little bit of bump uh, back here as the reed breaks from uh, uh, the table. And it's a little crooked here, a little too flat. You know, it's it's got a flat section and then it flips up near the tip. I've seen worse. I've seen better. Not bad for a mass-produced mouthpiece, but it doesn't really matter because we have to open it way up. So we got to destroy whatever's there. And I had already um, copied some target values from the last job I did for this client. So where we're heading is going to be to open it way up. The tip opening is going to go from, it's actually going to be further out here towards about 120. So be a lot, it's off the chart here, but the scale will um, readjust itself as we get into the job. Okay, uh, I'm going to bring in the big guns to get started. This is a uh, piece of, I think, about 110 grit on here. Fairly coarse. I use this to, when I have to cut uh, a lot of material out of a mouthpiece. Um, so I don't recommend you using something like this until you get a feel for her how fast uh, you can go on a mouthpiece uh, in terms of removing material. So, um, But I know that I have a long way to go. So, um, before I do that, the table on this mouthpiece was not flat. Ding! Let me get into that. Um, you can't see it. Uh, it's very subtle, but I, I have measured it earlier and um, it's got a high spot here and then it gradually uh, you know this the straight edge rocks on it a little bit so let me let me try to clean that up first now there's another way that you can tell that this is plastic instead of hard rubber there's also hard rubber and plastic blends but this is uh, the the dust that comes off of sanding it is white, or uh, on some plastic mouthpieces it, it's a kind of a purplish tint to it um, instead of a brown dust that would come off a of hard rubber. And you can see the scuffs on here, you know, and the dust is kind of gummy too compared to a hard rubber dust. So I'm, I'm very lightly lifting up on the heel as I as I cut this because I don't want to cut any material off the heel anymore. I want to take it off this high spot. So it is doing that. Switching to the finer sandpaper. Whoops. Okay, we can do. A, we can play with that some more later, but that right now is it. So I'm not gonna worry about vacuuming that. Get back to this rig here. This uh, gizmo that holds down and and stretches a piece of sandpaper uh, across the table is made by a company um, called uh, Sierra Bravo, Santa Cruz, California. I don't know if they still make these. I had purchased a number of these when I thought this was the way I was going to go with different grades of sandpaper, uh, but it was too difficult to switch them in and out, so that's why I gravitated towards this other system here, uh, having two gri uh, grits. So, anyhow, let's start cutting the tip. So, uh, I want to avoid cutting the table anymore, uh, or near the table. I would not recommend you're just tilting it a little bit and cutting here because um, we don't need much material off that, in fact probably none, and, and we should wait to do that on the other paper, but near the tip we need to do a lot of cutting. So, OK, 
Okay, you see how where I'm taking the material off and how that tip rail has gotten quite a bit wider and the side rails are already starting to fatten out. And on the end, didn't come off very uniform, but let's see where we're at. About 31. So I might take a few more passes. The material's coming off pretty fast. And what you what you have to avoid too is is maybe you didn't take too much material off the tip, but you might have taken too much off here in the middle. You don't want to overshoot any any point of it. So the uh, being how there's more material in the tip rail, you can like lean into that area a little bit more and avoid cutting the side rails. So this is actually uh, moving along fairly quickly. Let me check just one spot or so, maybe a couple spots, just to see where we're at and see how crooked we are. So if I drop in the 78, my target for that's around 11, so we're not, we haven't overshot that. It's not very crooked. Um, 49, my target for this is about 20 and a half. It's a little crooked, but again, we haven't overshot that. 26, uh, about 30 and a half was my target. So, if anything, I could probably take a little bit more, you know, back here in an area that I was avoiding. But I haven't overshot it, which, but I probably should stop. So, we're going to stop. I can back in that a little later. seven or so. My, my target was about 3.4 so we're really close to that. Um, now the, the, as I told you the, the tip now is probably not much there. You know I said we'd go down to ten thousandths and that's about what it looks like give or take five or so. Um, if you put a reed, I use these metal reeds for templates on there It's not a bad shape. We can round round the corners a little bit more. You know, it, it's the, the the middle is pretty good, but we can round the corners and we can bring it in a little bit. Um, and when you do that, um, you know, the 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 end will get a, a little more thickness in it. But it also means you may have to open the tip a little further.